Hello, welcome to Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Kate Harper of the 61st District in Montgomery County. Biotechnology, it's a rapidly growing field in Pennsylvania with many businesses located right in our area. This industry encompasses creating pharmaceuticals and medical devices for many chronic illnesses and diseases. As Big Pharma downsizes and outsources some of its research functions, entrepreneurial companies can grow here too, and that might lead to the next breakthrough. Recently, the House Republican Policy Committee met to hear from representatives from the biotech industry. They discussed the challenges facing their companies as they work in this very competitive field. Their insight was helpful to us as policymakers, and on today's program, I'd like to share portions of that committee hearing with you. At, at Pennsylvania Bio, we are tasked with doing two things every day. Uh, obviously, we advocate on behalf of our members in Harrisburg and in Washington, D.C. Uh, on policy issues that will help make Pennsylvania the most attractive place to open and operate a life sciences company. Uh, our second accountability we refer to as facilitating strategic connections. Uh, and that's more than a fancy way of saying we put on networking events, although we do that. Uh, we, we really do serve as, as a hub in that classic hub and spoke model, uh, really the hub for the life sciences community across Pennsylvania and even outside of our borders. So we, we connect our members with each other, we connect our members with resources that they need to advance and, and grow their businesses. Uh, and what, what, that, what that community looks like, um, the life sciences industry in Pennsylvania plays a tremendous role in, in the Commonwealth economy. Uh, there are more than 2,300 life sciences companies in Pennsylvania directly employing more than 77,000 Pennsylvanians. And when you consider the multiplier effect, the, the industry around the industry, there are about six jobs for every one job in life sciences. So a little bit of rough math, there are nearly half a million Pennsylvanians who are either directly or indirectly employed with work in the life sciences. Uh, Pennsylvania is, in fact, a major hub for the life sciences uh, and life sciences research. Last year, Pennsylvania-based research institutions attracted $1.5 billion in funding from the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. Uh, in fact, we can now boast having two of the top five funding recipients here in Pennsylvania from, from the NIH, the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Pennsylvania also ranked number four in venture capital investment and number four in academic institutions research and development spending. Uh, over the past hundred years, medicines have helped raise the U.S. life expectancy from 47 years of age to 78. The five-year cancer survival rates are up 39 percent across all cancers, and the death rate for cancer has fallen 22 percent from its peak in 1991. Additionally, the new hepatitis C therapies have cure rates of more than 90 percent. Cures, that's right, you heard, you heard that correct, cures. So when discussing the, the issue of drug price, there are several things to keep foremost in your minds. First, the percentage of the overall healthcare cost in the U.S. of prescription drugs has remained remarkably constant since the early 1960s at roughly 9 to 12 percent of the healthcare dollar. In recent months, health insurers have falsely claimed that it is drug prices that are driving up the premiums for their customers, uh, and it's really just the old game of, of passing the blame, because that, that percentage of overall cost to the system has remained at around the 10 percent number since the 1960s. Now, as you know, and you'll hear from, from the other panelists this morning, Pennsylvania competes each and every day on a global stage. Uh, this is true for my members in the Pennsylvania Bio Organization and also the larger life sciences community. At stake in this competition are these very valuable jobs that pay high salaries. Uh, jobs in the life sciences pay approximately $90,000 per year in Pennsylvania, which is roughly twice the average for all other industries. As Pennsylvania competes with these jobs and these companies, the Commonwealth has several programs that I'd, I'd like to acknowledge and briefly highlight. Uh, Pennsylvania's Research and Development Tax Credit, which is currently at $55 million each year, and its tradable nature provides critical cash to young companies. For example, we have a young medical device company in Chairman Benninghoff's district 
uh, that over the past six years has successfully applied for eight patents. The patent approvals for, the, for that company cost the company about $520,000. During that same period, because the company kept increasing its R&D expenditure, the CEO was able to trade her tax credits and netted $505,000, almost covering the entire cost of the patents. In 2015, just under 12 million of R&D tax credits were awarded to life sciences co companies. In each of the past three legislative sessions, there has been legislation to raise the cap to $100 million, and I would urge you to consider and support that increase so that more companies can access this tax credit. I appreciate your interest in Pennsylvania's vital life science industry. And I use the word industry, but it may be more apt to refer to it as the life science community or ecosystem. As my colleague and friend Chris Molyneux uh, uh, explained, the life science industry is an incredibly robust and diverse sector that sustains hundreds of thousands of families across the state. And yet the life science community in Pennsylvania is different than any other business sector because all of our companies serve one higher mission, to improve the quality of life. No other sector can say that its core function is to create technologies that improve and save lives. And I think that's an important distinction to make. We are in the business of using science to make lives better. But even with the strong community we have in Pennsylvania, I worry, along with Chris, that the Commonwealth is starting to fall behind. The industry has changed following the Great Recession of 2007-2008, and while other states have enacted policy changes to adapt to this new world, Pennsylvania has not followed in step. After the Great Recession, funding for early stage life science companies dried up. Venture capital firms and the pharmaceutical companies became more conservative with their investments, and there's been a dramatic drop off in support for technologies before they can reach a later stage. The work of the Ben Franklins and the Life Science Greenhouse is wonderful. But a wide gap remains between these companies, uh, the, between, uh, before these companies can reach the point of maturity and see follow on investments. Multiple states, including all the states that are widely regarded as leaders in life science, such as Massachusetts and North Carolina, have created programs that match federal funding or create other avenues to give early stage life science companies the investment they need to succeed and grow. To get to the point where the private funders can get engaged. The Science Center and other innovation intermediaries across the state are doing what we can to plug the gap that's emerged, but we need the help of the Commonwealth. We have wonderful research institutions, but if we do not catch up with other states to create better support for early stage companies, Pennsylvania is going to lose its competitive advantage and other companies are going to go elsewhere to form, scale, and succeed. The building that we're meeting in today is a good example of the innovation ecosystem we have in the Commonwealth and why we need to broaden the public-private partnerships to put Pennsylvania where it is today. Not only is this building home to the Science Center's corporate offices, but it's home to more than 25 companies that are developing technologies that will transform people's lives. One floor below us, is a company called Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals. They're using a molecular imaging technology to identify the first stages of pathological changes associated with Alzheimer's disease, potentially assisting in early diagnosis, better management and development of new therapies. Born out of discoveries at the University of Pennsylvania, Avid entered the Science Center's incubator in 2005 with one employee, the founder. They grew to 37 employees and moved into their own dedicated space in 2009. A year later, they were acquired by Eli Lilly in a deal worth up to $800 million. This represents Lilly's first president in Pennsylvania. Now a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Lilly, Avid has more than 100 employees and remains right here at the Science Center. One floor above us is Invisible Sentinel. You'll hear from their co-founder, Ben uh, Pascal, in a moment. Ben and his team have developed, developed and now manufacture rapid diagnostic kits to detect foodborne pathogens at the molecular level, keeping things like milk, juice, and chicken safe while making sure beer and wine taste the way they should. And right on this floor, a few doors away, BioBots is creating 3D bioprinters and bio inks that researchers around the world are using to print bone, organs, and tumors out of biological material literally printing living organisms on their own desktops for
for research in their labs. The business of making life better through science is certainly exciting and fascinating, but this business is not, in, uh, is not an easy one, and it entails a great deal of time and investment. Every pill that your mother or father takes to ease joint pain and every device that your doctor uses to check on your son or your daughter's health is the product of many years and millions of dollars of research, development, testing, and investment. Turning brilliant research and development into thriving companies is the key to building a successful life science industry, and that's where the Science Center comes in. Founded as a nonprofit enterprise in 1963, the Science Center has been incubating businesses long, um, since long before the term business incubation was coined. We are the, first, the nation's first and largest urban research park and one of, uh, one of the only multi-institutional research parks in the country. Our 31 shareholders represent top academic and in research institutions across much of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. We currently have a suite of programs to commercialize academic, academic technologies. Our QED proof of concept uh, program was founded in 2009 as the nation's first multi-institutional proof of concept program for life sciences. Partnering with 15 institutions across the Commonwealth, QED provides business development support for researchers developing early stage technologies, hel helping them to retire the business risk in these early stage projects and increase their attractiveness to follow on investment by establishing life science companies and private investors. Our phase one ventures program works with long horizon intellectual property to help newly formed companies build R&D, management and strategic capabilities. The program leverages the Science Center's connections to corporate and product development professionals to get the companies on the path to success. And our digital health accelerator helps health information technology companies with products at the prototype stage as they move forward to reach their first sales and venture capital investments. Through the years, four, 442 companies have received incubation services from the Science Center. Our biggest success, success is Senecor now known as Janssen Biotech. Senecor developed Remicade, which treats rheumatoid arthritis and other conditions. Now owned by Johnson & Johnson, Remicade is Johnson & Johnson's biggest selling drug. Today, the 155 firms incubated here at the Science Center that are located in the greater Philadelphia uh, area directly employ 12,000 people. And those are high paying jobs with the average salary of $103,000 nearly double the region's uh, medium annual wage of $52,000. There's a ripple effect as well. Each direct job in the region generates more than two additional jobs. That's a total of 40,000 direct and indirect jobs, or one out of every 100 jobs in the region. And these 40,000 jobs that drive $13 billion in economic activity in the region each year, that's more than 2% of the region's total economic output. Multiply these numbers across the Commonwealth and you see that the life science sector is an economic powerhouse to be reckoned with. One of our incubator graduates, Adaptimmune, highlights the future of the life science industry in Pennsylvania. Adaptimmune's technology is focused on innovative T-cell therapies to treat cancer. One of the reasons Adaptimmune chose Philadelphia was because of the work of Dr. Carl June here at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. June is creating breakthroughs in the world of immunotherapy developing ways of genetically, to gen genetically engineer the body's own immune cells to be able to find, attack, and eliminate cancer. We're just beginning to see the potential for these revolutionary technologies. And Dr. June is not alone. Last year, Vice President Biden launched his Moonshot to Cure Cancer here in Philadelphia for a reason. Researchers at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Thomas Jefferson, Temple, Fox Chase, Wistar, and ev elsewhere quickly making Philadelphia an internationally recognized center for excellence in immunotherapy research. We will need to continue the continued support from the Commonwealth to make sure that this world-renowned research leads to world-renowned companies that will drive our, own, our state's economy for years to come. Militia Hill Ventures was started to take an active role in building companies, life sciences companies, in this region. Things don't happen by themselves. Um, we talk a lot, uh, those of us who are in this community, about the, um, the problems that we have, the weaknesses that we have, the goals that we have, 
And always capital is at the top of the list. Access to capital. No matter how good we are, how much experience we have, what great science we have, without the capital, none of it ever gets anywhere. It's just the way it is. Um, we have a great starting point because of the NIH funding we have in this, in this state. Um, and we have extensive discussions with the universities, with um, other sources of assets. You can bring those technologies from anywhere. We want them to be used from here, um, if at all possible. So what I decided to do was make this an active process. Um, I want to compare a little bit, and uh, we've heard about other regions and the money that they are putting into this sector. I want to compare us a little bit to Boston, because as a practical matter, people like me who have been in these companies and have um, background here, all of the talent that we have around here is, is really being drawn to Boston. And the reason is because there are jobs there, there are companies there, there's a lot of, uh, there's community there. And I, for one, did not want to move to Boston. I didn't want to commute to Boston. So the answer is we need to use our resources here to keep our talent here. The talent is our greatest strength. Um, but if we don't keep it here, it will gradually disappear. So what, does, what has Boston done that we can take some lessons from? Number one, they created a very strong physical core, some of it just by, um, by nature uh, in Cambridge, so that investors, company founders, entrepreneurs, employees, academic founders, experts um, could all be bumping into each other from a f in an informal and formal way. They could all get to know each other and work with each other. It sounds um, perhaps maybe old school when you think about technology and the way things work now, but at the end of the day, we're people. And I'm much more comfortable working with people that I know and that I trust. And so is venture capital. Money goes to people that they know and they trust. Um, so having that talent pool get to know each other, whether you're an investor, whether you're an incubator, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're in the university system, is critical. We located Militia Hill Ventures in University City for that reason, to try to help build up the core that already exists here. We have the University Science Center, we have the universities, we have Chris and his team having events here, trying to build that community. We wanted to be part of that. We also provide collaborative workspace, just like the University City Science Center. We need more of that to make it easier for early stage companies to interact with each other and to be a cheaper, easier way to build, so you're not paying for space that you actually don't need at the time. We spend a lot of time working with the next generation of entrepreneurs or uh, talent that will move into our companies. For example, we have uh, discussions ongoing with one of the local universities who have a lot of PhD candidates who are interested in getting into the biotech sector. Well, how do they do that? They don't know really what it is. They're great scientists who are well-trained. They need that bridge, so we are providing that bridge. And any, any programs, ideas that we can do to help encourage that relationship, encourage universities to work with industry and vice versa, um, we'll, we'll continue to build our talent pool. We at Militia Lil have spent, uh, we're, we're relatively young, the first couple of years really trying to bring more capital to this region. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough go, but it has to be done, and I'm committed to doing whatever I can, and I know the others are, uh, sitting here with me are as well. Um, we need to get more resident capital here. If we can take some sort of a program, however large or small from the state, we can leverage that with private capital. And um, I think that's a, a really important uh, thought to take from this, because capital is the key. It's been an evolution in what venture funds are doing in our space. It used to be I had a great idea, I would put a business plan together, and I'd run around and, and talk to those with capital and try to convince them to invest in my company. Now, more and more, the funds that are large enough to invest in particularly therapeutics companies, which require more money, are doing it themselves. Um, so 
there's a reason for that because those kinds, they take the risk themselves. They feel more comfortable with that risk when they bring in their own people. Um, we at Militia Hill have decided to do the same thing. We don't have the funds here, the venture funds here doing it. They're doing it a lot more in Boston, for example. But we can do the same thing here, and we are. So we are actively building companies here. What we don't have is the fund, the, the capital fund, but so we're working with other funds to do the same thing. But actively building companies means you put the talent, the assets, typically from the university system, and the capital together from the outset so that you're going to build a, a foundation that allows it to grow quickly and, and pour the money into the, the, the capital, um, the assets, the scientific assets that you really need. So active company building, Boston has been exceedingly good at, and we are doing the same thing here. We will do it better if we have more people doing it and we have some active funds here that can also do it. Chairwoman Harper. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm from Montgomery County, home of Merck, J&J, &J, Teva, and a whole bunch of other uh, pharmaceutical companies, and their doing well is important to our commonwealths doing well. So I guess um, I saw all three of you hit it in your written testimony, and I also um, read the papers this morning, too, and I'm worried about the fact that Pennsylvania seems to be losing um, both jobs and scientists, doctor, medical research type doctors to Massachusetts because their uh, program is in some respects better than ours. Can you address that directly and tell us what we could do better so that we don't lose jobs and scientists and doctors to Massachusetts? I mean, we have University City, they got Harvard, okay, you know, but we have the same quality doctors who are doing research and we have the same quality pharmaceutical companies right here in the Delaware Valley, and they do, we do seem to be losing jobs and people to Massachusetts. Can you help me with that? Uh, th thank you, Representative Harbor. I, I will, I'll start by saying, um, <clears throat> I, yeah, I think you're referring to the announcement this morning that Merck is laying off folks from North, North Wales, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> that's gonna happen in industry. Um, I think that, as Chris mentioned, uh, the pharma companies are doing less in-house discovery work particularly in, in therapeutics and drugs. And they're, be, they're outsourcing that more to contracts and collaborations at universities. So clearly we, in, within Pennsylvania, have to be in the market of being business friendly from the university side to attract those types of, that type of funding. The other thing I'd say is that um, this happens when an industry matures. We see it in the auto industry, we see it in the airplane industry. The farm industry is in the process of further consolidation and it's going to happen. We saw that, unfortunately, with Pfizer taking over the Wyeth um, right. um, labs and, and facilities in Collegeville and essentially... Another Montgomery County yes, pharmaceutical. <laughs> yes, precisely. This, this really does hit home. So part of it is to be able to repurpose those employees with very specialized knowledge, and a lot of them are going into service functions to help companies that Jane is, is, is forming and that the members of, of PA Bio uh, need. So these are, these are clinical research organizations and especially research. So they're moving to the service side. So that, it, that part of it can help, help retain. The other thing is we have to create an ecosystem where we have big and small companies and where the small companies are likely to be acquired by big companies that are here in Pennsylvania. So that's the way that the food chain really works here is that you have to have a constant flow of innovation. You have to have companies that proceed from startup to small to medium large size companies that stay here in Pennsylvania and they have to be thematically around things that matter. So if we look at what's happening right now in gene and immunotherapy, this is a hotbed particularly right. for Philadelphia right now. It's a very specialized set of Pen skills. And researchers are reporting new things every day. Absolutely. So we have to create an industry around that it absorbs it and keeps it here in Pennsylvania. So there's both an offensive and a defensive strategy I think we can play to retain the jobs. But those that are laid off, I think, have to find ways into the entrepreneurial world in some respect to be able to, to reinvent themselves in their careers. Yeah, I, I would just add to that the, um, to a couple of numbers. From two th the fourth quarter of 2008 through the fourth quarter of 2014, which is the most current time frame we have these numbers, uh, there were more than 720 new R&D-based companies formed in Pennsylvania. Uh, now, they're not all life sciences, the state Department of Labor doesn't cut it out that way, but even if it's half that, 
that, that is tremendous growth of new startups. And the majority of those new startups are in the contract research organizations, where those functions that were formerly performed in-house in a big pharma company, those folks are laid off, they go out, they raise money, they form a, a service. Uh, and one company that I frequently point to is, is um, uh, up in Doylestown called Flowmetric. Uh, this was created by a former scientist, or he's still a scientist, a scientist formerly with with uh, Senecor and then Johnson & Johnson, who performed flow cytometry. I won't get into what flow cytometry is, I can barely spell it, but the, he, he performed that on a, in-house for J&J. &J. When he was laid off and his department was eliminated, he formed his own company. He now has five big pharma clients performing the same function. So he's creating jobs, he's performing the same function, he's essentially, as Steve said, repurposed what he does into this new environment where most of these R&D functions are now performed on an outsourced basis. So that, that, that climate, that ecosystem is, is crucial uh, and the, the repurposing of folks, getting them to understand that those jobs in big pharma that they were accustomed to for so many years, decades, uh, just don't exist anymore. It's a new model and it's all part of the evolution. Yeah, I would say literally every single day I get um, an email, a call from somebody, and multiples in, in, in a single day from Big Pharma looking to figure out what this biotech thing is because they know the world is changing and pharma is shrinking, pharma is evolving, pharma is merging, um, and the pipeline for pharma is more and more in the smaller companies. So we need um, this core ecosystem where we're closer to each other, working with each other, collaborating with each other, talking to each other, having drinks with each other, getting to know each other. That is a critical piece of it because we're people and we need to function that way socially. Um, and that will lead to a better environment to build companies. And if you don't build the new ones, they'll all leave. It's just the fact. And that's why you know people are commuting to Boston. And you go to the airport on Monday morning in Philadelphia for the, the flights to Boston, you'll meet lots of them um, every week. So uh, they don't enjoy doing that, but they enjoy the work. Um, and so we can keep those people here and they want to be here and that's, that's what we need to focus on. I, I, I will also just add that this is sort of, sort of separate from the, the core ecosystem we're trying to create, but part of it is also positioning for the state. And there is a buzz about Cambridge that everyone in the biotech community and the big pharma community is familiar with. Uh, and you talk about San Francisco, same, same buzz. When folks refer to medical devices, automatically think about Minnesota because you've got one big player and a number of small players in Minnesota. Pennsylvania has all of those life sciences stakeholders. Pharma, mm -hmm. biotech, devices, diagnostics, we've got the academic community, we've got investors, we've got healthcare IT but it's not very well known outside the borders of Pennsylvania. So we are not, we don't have the same kind of attractant uh, publicly that, that these other regions do. We, we have a proposal in front of the Department of Community and Economic Development to run essentially a strategic communications campaign to raise awareness of the life sciences prowess of Pennsylvania. So I would encourage the, the committee to look at that proposal as well. So that would be a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I do want to mention to the members of the committee, in 2009, the Secretary of Commerce told me I had more unemployed PhDs than any other district in the state. And we both thought I might have more than any other district in the country. We have such smart people here, and we don't want to lose them to Massachusetts. Thank you. Well. That's all the time we have for today's program. I'm State Representative Kate Harper. If you need assistance with any state government matter, feel free to contact me at my local office. The address and phone number will be shown in just a moment. Thanks for watching. Please join me next time for Legislative Reports.